you, Mark and Taylor, as always. And the deacon is still fooling with the thermostat. <laughs> we don't want the pastor to get hot, do we? One of his main responsibilities. <laughs> Well, open your Bibles up to the book of Romans, if you would, please. That's where I have mine open, too. And uh, today we'll be reading verses 1 through 7. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he wrote an especially long introduction. It goes all the way through verse 17. So we're actually reading just a few verses of his introduction to this book. And it is enough to get me where I want to go in this message. And uh, I want to show you the title of my message today, okay? Yeah. The me I see is the me I'll be. I'll tell you who said that pretty soon. You might think that it has something to do with looking in the mirror and seeing someone looking back at you, trying to identify that person. Have you ever done that? Mm -hmm. Trying to identify that person. Well, that's what it is. The me I see is the me I'll be. And if we can, let's stand and I'll read these first seven verses. <clears throat> There is something I want you to watch for now. Three times in these seven verses, Paul uses the word C-A-L-L-E-D, -L 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 called. And that's basically what I'm going to be looking at mostly, would be uh, Paul's use of the word called. Verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We bow our heads, Father, as we have read your word, and we always trust, Father, that uh, you will be our guide and our teacher as we move through here. And um, I feel wholly inadequate to explain this passage of Scripture to each and every person sitting here, Father. I'll do what you've led me to do, and Father, I just trust that the Holy Spirit will apply this passage to every person as they need to hear it and see it. And we will thank you for that, Father. We will thank you for that. In the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. So the Apostle Paul wants to introduce the, the book of Romans. And, and I was, uh, I'm reading the book of Romans right now. I'm in chapter, I think I'll, I'll do chapter 12 tomorrow in my, in my devotion time. And... Uh, I've been reading it very slow. You know, sometimes I read in my devotions, I'll read for quantity, and I'll read three or four, five, six, seven chapters a day, you know. Other times, I'll read one chapter. And so that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, it takes me quite a while to get through the New Testament at that rate, but that's what I'm doing right now, is reading one chapter at a time. And so the last time I read this, I noticed the word called, you know, and you've probably heard me say this before, but I like numbers. I like numbers. And they make sense to me. I just like numbers. And when I see a word repeated in, in a passage, it clicks in my mind that the author of that passage, and in this case, the Apostle Paul, is saying, I want you to hear something. Paul was called to be an apostle. You were called to belong to Jesus Christ. And you were called to be a 
What's that word there at the end? Saint. Yeah. Any saints out there today? My wife raised her hand. She heard the sermon in the car last night. I preached the sermon to my daughter and son-in-law in the car last night coming back from Fayetteville. Probably shouldn't have. They said, well, we're just going to sleep in tomorrow. I want you to see what the Apostle Paul said here. Look at your Bible with me just for a moment. I want you to see in verse 1, and I'm just going to do this quickly because I want to get to those words called and especially one of those in particular. Paul begins the letter by identifying himself. I'm Paul. And he said, my identity is that I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. That's what he said. That's his relationship to Christ is that he's a servant, but he also has a divine calling on his life, and that is to be an apostle. So Paul says, I've been called to be an apostle. Now here's a little bit about what that means. Paul did not say, I was born to be an apostle. I heard a lady on TV one time, and she was singing, I don't know, some kind of pop song, you know, and I didn't understand half the words. And at the end of it, they interviewed her, and she says, I was born to sing. I thought, well, maybe she was, but she's singing the wrong tune. Well, Paul says, I was called to be an apostle. He doesn't mean he was born to be an apostle. He doesn't mean he went to school to be an apostle, right? Right? Does he mean either one of those? Absolutely not. He means God called him at some point and juncture in his life. God called him to be an apostle. And that's how Paul wants you to know him. His name's Paul, he's a servant of Jesus Christ, and he was called to be an apostle. So he goes on and he says, I was set apart for the gospel of God. Now he tells you exactly what he's going to do. He's set apart for the gospel of God. And verse 2 he says, which he promised beforehand through the prophets. Paul was saying, the gospel that I preach is not new. That was what that was what so many were offended by Paul's gospel when he preached it. They said, oh, he's just preaching some new sect about the Jewish faith. Paul says, no, the gospel I preach was preached by the prophets. And we can certainly go back to the prophets and identify such places like that. And then he, he, uh, he says, what she, verse 2, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, What's the gospel? Verse 3, concerning his son. The gospel is concerning his son. And that just seems so simple when we say it that way. But I think sometimes we get so confused about what the gospel is about. Listen, this morning, let's just focus on what's the gospel about. It's about his son. Verses 3 and 4, Paul writes that, that uh, Jesus is descended from David. That's his human nature. Verse 4, he talks about the son of uh, uh, the spirit of holiness uh, by his resurrection from the dead, that's his divine nature. You know, we could spend forever on verses 3 and 4, and you can see I'm passing those up pretty quick this morning. And so Paul said in verse 5, I have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among, among and this is so important, among all nations. All nations. I think that's so important for us just to think about that for a moment, all nations. And uh, verse 6 he says, I belong to Jesus, including you who are called to belong to Jesus. Does your Bible say belong? I think most of, most of the versions say belong there in verse 6, don't they? Belong to Jesus? I, I hope they do. Included you who are called to belong to Jesus. And then he finishes, to all of those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Wow. And so Paul sees this word called as being an effective tool of God that he calls people into his work and his ministry. That's what Paul says. Called me to be an apostle. I've called to belong to Jesus and I'm called to be a saint. Pretty clear there, Paul using that word called. So what we find here in this passage is about this word called. What does that mean to be called? You know, does it mean, hey you? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means, Harry, I'm talking to you. It's a specific calling to a person. It is not the general call of salvation, like when a, an evangelist gets up here, you know, and 
paces the floor back and forth, pounds the pupil a couple of times, and calls you a sinner and gives an hour-long invitation, you know? That's what we call a general call. Paul is talking about a specific call that came true in your life. And maybe you weren't called to be an apostle, but you were called to belong to Jesus. You ever think about yourself belonging to Jesus? I know we think about those verses that said, you know, that we're bought, bought and paid for with a price. But right here he says you belong to Jesus. And then he said you're called to be saints. And I think of all the called here, of all the use of the word called, called to be an apostle, we understand that, and then called to and called to belong to Jesus, I, I think we pretty much understand that. But here's where I think we have trouble understanding, and it's what led me to this title right here, is we are called to be saints. We're used to the word saint belonging to the Roman Catholic Church, right? They've kind of captured that word, and it kind of belongs to them. If you hear the word saint, you know, it, it, it's, well, saint who, you know? And I'm not judging them or anything, just saying the way they use the word saint is they, they designate certain people because uh, supposedly they did something pretty great like a miracle, and so they call them saints, you know? So I don't know about our deacon sitting here if we need to call him Saint Bob from now no. on. We'd have to check with his wife on that, right? That'd be the person who could tell us the truth. Well, no, we're not talking about calling somebody saint. I'm not suggesting that from now on Harry and I call, uh, that, that he calls me Saint Bruce and I call him Saint Harry. What I want you to understand, I believe, as my title says, this word saint has something to do with our position in Christ. Our position in Him. Now I want to tell you the truth about this word. Here's a test, okay? I'm going to test you. In all of Paul's 13 epistles, when he's writing and referring to groups of believers in certain city or the body of Christ at large, what word does Paul use to designate them? Is it Christian? You know, Paul doesn't use the word Christian once. Is it believer? Well, Paul does use that word eight times, actually. Believers. Is it even the word righteous? Well, Paul uses the word righteousness a whole lot. But he doesn't actually designate believers as righteous too many times. He does. What word do you suppose is more common in all of Paul's writings to designate the body of Christ at large? What do you suppose that word is? I bet you all know, because I'm leading up to my word here, and it's the word saint. I just want to read a couple of verses to you. I want you to hear what Paul says. Just, just Paul's casual use of the word saint. I have four verses here I'll read rather quickly. And he who searches hearts know what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints. Yeah, the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Romans 8, 27. Ephesians 3, 8. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Philippians 4.22 All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.13 So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God, and listen to this, before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Yeah. 39 times he uses that. So I'm going to tell you a story now. Here's my rub about this whole thing. Linda and I, of course, when we were full-time RVers for four years, we spent the parts of three summers in Olathe, Colorado. Olathe, Colorado is where Olathe corn comes from. If you ever buy it in the store, it says Olathe corn. That's where it comes from. Olathe, Colorado, uh, Colorado, I always say Colorado, Colorado is on the western slopes of the Rockies. It's, it's, it's very near the border with Utah. We found a wonderful little RV park there in Olathe, Colorado. Is maybe, I don't know, seven or 800 population, huh? something like that. And so we always looked for a church to go to, and we found this little church called the Olathe Bible Church. I thought, all right, 
they call, got the word Bible in their name. We're going to go to that church. So we went to that church, and the pastor was a very, very young man. I mean, very young man. Had a dear little wife, and they had two small children, and I could tell they were working hard. And he played the violin before he, he preached, and so I thought, I'm outclassed right there, you know. He played the violin, and, he, and that first sermon we heard, we, we enjoyed it. And so we asked him out to lunch, and so we took him to lunch. They had one Mexican restaurant in town. It was good, wasn't it, huh? Yeah, and so we took him out to lunch, got to know him a little bit, came back the next Sunday. And so he's up there preaching away, and he's doing okay, you know. We could tell... You know, there was a few things he needed to understand a little more, but he was doing okay. I, I wasn't judging him. Then he came to the end of the sermon. Here's what he said. He's getting ready to give an invitation. I like invitations, you know. He's getting ready to give an invitation. He said, he's calling on people to come forward. He said, after all, after all, we are just sinners saved by grace. My jaws locked up. My mind went, no, tell me he didn't just say that. But do you know something that's a common phrase? Do you know that? Sinners saved by grace. You see, I find that so against and the opposite of the fact that we are called to be saints. I do not think of myself as a sinner. That's not saying I don't sin, but I do not think of myself as a sinner. You know, you can go online, go to YouTube, you'll find servants, sinners saved by grace. I wish I could just delete them myself, and I would. Even the Gaither sang that, sang that great song, and I've heard them sing it before, Sinner Just Saved by Grace. And oh, they harmonized so well, and they had all the instruments, and they had five or six singing it, but... In my opinion, it is not true. That's what I believe. I just don't think God sees me as a sinner. I think He sees me as a saint who's learning to become exactly that. And so I'm challenging each of you as to how you think about yourself. Do you think you're a sinner? I mean, isn't that preposterous to suggest that God has sinners in his family? <laughs> or Jesus died just so we could put the word saved on the front of it? I think it has a lot to do with the me I see is the me I'll be. In fact, you know what it really is, what this really is here? It wasn't said by, by the likes of Sigmund Freud or Abraham Maslow or anybody like that. It was said by a favorite preacher of mine, a man named Adrian Rogers. You can find him on YouTube too. He's under Love Worth Finding. He said that. Because I think Adrian must have believed a whole lot like I'm thinking here. You know, the Bible talks about a Christian mindset. A mindset. You know what a mindset is? Didn't I write a definition down? Yeah, a mindset is a way of thinking, a set of beliefs or attitude. And I don't know how much we think about mindsets as Christians. I've got some verses here I want to read to you about that too. Listen to this. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. That's a Christian mindset. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2. 5. And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So I think the Bible very definitely, very definitely gives us the idea of an understanding of a Christian mindset. I mean, we read those verses, and um, the word mind I've used several times more than that. Set not your affection on things above. So, we understand that our mind is part of what is redeemed in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And sometimes it's the most difficult part for us to tame is the mind. And I think maybe part of the very beginning of all of this is understanding that we are saints. Now, we weren't born saints. We're not going to church to learn to become a saint. But God called us to be saints. That doesn't mean he called us to be saints in heaven. That's one of the things that so many people about this say because maybe you recognize not everybody agrees with me on this. You've got a right to be wrong though, you know. It's okay. God didn't save us to become saints in heaven. He called us to be saints in the here and now. How else would Paul say, the saints at Philippi greet you? We're called to be saints now. And so that's what I say. The me I see is the me I'll be. How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a saved sinner? Or do you see yourself as a called saint? And maybe it's neither of those. Maybe it's just something that in your mind you had never felt before that you needed to, to, to find a place in your mind to settle down on that. But I'm suggesting to you the frequency with which the Apostle Paul uses the word saint in referring to the body of Christ, we may actually need to come to a place like that. Now maybe uh, we might ask ourselves, you know, well, I ask myself this, where did that come from? Where did we ever get the idea that as that young preacher in Colorado said, after all, we're just sinners saved by grace. And actually, I've heard that phrase a lot. You know where it came from? I mean, I'm up here, I'm up here wading in pretty high, pretty high water right now, because you know where it came from? Martin Luther. Not Martin Luther King Jr., bless his heart, Martin Luther, period. Of the reformers, the name that we attach the most to all of the reformers, although there were, there were many reformers, he's just the one who has kind of become the iconic figure of, of the Reformation. Martin Luther once said that a Christian is both a sinner and righteous at the same time. And so... Not knowing exactly what he meant by that, many people have capitalized off that, and they've come to this place where, after all, we're just sinners saved by grace. Well, you know, I find the word saint comforting. Because my wife's here, and she'll tell you I'm not perfect. You remember one time a couple of years ago I wasn't perfect, right? <laughs> She'll tell you I'm not perfect. That's not what we're talking about here at all, and please don't carry that away from here. I'm just saying God says we're saints. How can you, how, how can you refute the fact that Paul says we're called to be saints? And when he's talking to the believers at Philippi, he says the saints in your church. And do I think it makes a difference what we think about ourselves? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we all think about ourselves. You know? I look at the man in the mirror every morning and I say, you can't be 82 years old. <laughs> and he looks back and goes, oh, but I am. We all look at ourselves in the mirror. And we have introspective thoughts about who we are, don't we? I mean, I'm not the only person in the world that does that, am I? Of course not. And if we're thinking about our life with Christ, if we're thinking about our witness in the world, if we're thinking about our spiritual growth, do you want to start with yourself as a sinner or a saint? Personally, I think it's offensive to the Lord Jesus Christ to think that he died on the cross, gave his life for us, that we could be called saved sinners. I just don't think it's true. I think we are saved 
saints. We're making progress in the word, and the word sanctification comes very close to being the same as the word saint. So, um, as I said, we get this from, from Martin Luther. And I don't know this for a fact, but just let me suggest a couple of reasons why some people may still believe this. Why some Christians may carry this vision about, about themselves. The most obvious one is what? That they are sinners. That they have not allowed the work of sanctification to take place in their lives and they're still living the same life they lived prior to the time that they received Christ. And so they are not living a holy or sanctified life in any shape or form. And so when the preacher says, oh, after all, we're just saved sinners, they go, amen, brother, preach it. Yeah, preach it, brother, amen, amen to that. You know, that could be the reason. Because as Christians, we know we're not perfect. We know we sin. Uh, John tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And why would John tell us that if we didn't need that? So we do. And I keep repeating that point a little bit because it's not about that. It's about how we see ourselves. And I believe what Adrian Rogers said. The me I see is the DLD. And I believe it when, when, when the Apostle Paul and others write about our minds here and they tell us, be not, be not transformed by the world, but be renewed by your mind. I think, I, I think part of the renewal by our mind, it's just, a, just a part of it is, is that we look in there and we see a saint. A saint that may regularly fail God, but nonetheless, nonetheless, striving to be that person God has called us to be. And so then I think the other reason I would say that maybe some people hold on to that is because they don't know any better. That their pastor or their Bible teacher or you know, however they have grown up in, 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 in their Christian life, you know, they just don't know any better. But if you're not sure that you believe what I'm saying, just get you a concordance and look up the word saint in the New Testament. Paul used it 39 times, but it appears 61 times in the New Testament. And as I said, I'm a numbers man. When I see something occurring over and over and over in the Bible, I say, okay, God, I think you're trying to say something to me. And you know I'm a little slow up here sometimes, so you're saying it over and over and over and over. So there may be reasons why we believe that. I don't think there's too many. I think it's that we're living a careless life. Allowing sin to shove us here and to shove us there, and we think, well, it's okay, I'm a saved sinner. Or we just simply haven't heard it before. And I think Dr. Adrian Rogers, one of the great preachers of the past decades, <clears throat> told his congregation that however you picture yourself, that's how you're going to live. And that's what he's saying here. So, here's what I think we need to do, in my opinion. Here's what we need to do. Number one, we need to believe that God has called us to be saints. Did you read that in verse 7? Yeah? Did you read that? Called to be saints. I mean, if you got no further than that today, that would be significant. Called to be saints. And I want to suggest that a person cannot be a sinner and a saint at the same time. I am a saint, yes, who still sins, but I do not view myself as a sinner. I am saved under the grace and the love of God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I think we need to believe that God has called us to be saints. I think you'd have to explain to yourself how you could be both a saint and a sinner as your identity. 
Secondly, I think we need to believe that God has equipped us to be saints. He's equipped us to be holy. In fact, if you're reading from an NIV Bible, it doesn't even say saint there. It says, it says holy people. Uh, I'm sorry, I like the word saint there. You've got to believe that God equipped you and God will walk with you and the Holy Spirit will lead you and He'll forgive you all along the way as we learn to live as saints. And you know, if you're not going to learn to live as a saint, just go on, jump off the edge and live to learn as a sinner. I mean, what, what are you going to do? I think we need to believe that God has equipped us to be holy. Third, I think we need to believe that this is your pathway to spiritual growth. See, we all understand we're supposed to grow in Christ, right? That's not a, that's not a new or uncommon phrase. We're, we're supposed to grow in Christ. And Christ is up here and we're down here, and yet we understand that God has equipped us to grow in Christ. And so it's got to t we've got to take a stand and we've got to start somewhere. We see that the Lord Jesus in His perfection and divinity is so far above us we think we could never do that. And that's right, we never can. But nonetheless, He has called us to do it. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father who is in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. You have to believe that this is your pathway to spiritual growth. And you do want to grow spiritually, right? That's what it is, a Christian. We, we grow up spiritually as Christians. I mean, I became a Christian at 11 years old, and I didn't know anything at 11 years old. I didn't know there was such a thing as a trinity. I didn't. I didn't know there was a rapture or any ending to the end times. I didn't know there were end times. I'm 11 years old. We've got to believe it's your pathway to spiritual growth. I trust that I have grown from the time I was 11 years old. But listen, here this could be the most important of all these four things that I've suggested we need to do. Is that we must believe that in this, understanding our identity in Christ, that He called us to be saints, we have to believe that in this, God is glorified. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God. That's the chief end of man. And in this, we can glorify God. Can you imagine a person such as myself? You know, I define myself as fallible, fickled, finite, Anything else, you can start with an F like that. That's how I describe myself. But God has equipped me in salvation through the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life that I can, that I can bring glory to the great God and Redeemer and Creator of the world, God the Father in heaven. And listen, if I'm wallowing in the fact that, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, I don't know. You know, I don't know why you'd say that or why you'd think that. You know, maybe, maybe you think, you know, in some kind of humbling way, you're humbling yourself before God and saying, oh God, I know I'm just a sinner. You know, maybe, maybe you just somehow think you're humbling yourself before God and that's a positive thing to do. Well, it would be if it says in the Bible, it just doesn't say it. Did I say that? A Christian is never called a sinner once in the New Testament? I think I didn't say that. Not once in the New Testament is a Christian ever called a sinner. Paul calls them saints 39 times. Does it make a difference? I think it does. So, you know, thinking about the word saint, I'll just illustrate for you how deep I am. I thought of the song when the saints, yeah, that's right, Mark can sing it for us. 
When the saints go marching in, you know, I looked that up. I said, I want to know who wrote that. And I looked it up, and the author is unknown, but they think it came from the Bah Baham Bahamas somewhere. Yeah. And it was written as a Christian hymn when the saints go marching in. And of course, now we think of New Orleans, right? And the funerals they have, and the bands they have, and they play it, and they sing it, and all the way to the cemetery. It's kind of a funeral, part of the funeral march now. But sometime back in, they think, the 1800s, late 1800s, somebody wrote that. Some sweet Christian person somewhere wrote that. And listen, they didn't write when the sinners go marching in. It was when the saints go marching in. They knew it. The person who wrote that song, he or she knew it in the last half of the 19th century. Why is it that we have preachers, pastors, Bible teachers standing up and saying, oh, we're just sinners saved by grace. You know, to me it is just close to heresy. Close to heresy. And I just can't believe that that song made anything but what it says when the saints go marching in. And so I'm going to close in just a moment, but I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me right now. I know this is kind of childish, okay? Yeah, this is kind of childish. But I want you to say this with me. I want you to say it out loud because I want you to hear yourself say this. Will you do that? Okay, here we go. The me I see is the me I'll be. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We rejoice, Lord, that you are here today in the person of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I know that I could never do a perfect work of expounding any word or scripture. But I know that you can, Father. And I just trust today that somewhere along the way, you have identified something for every person sitting here for them to think about in their personal life.